Good morning, everyone, and welcome to St. Andrew's United Church worship on the fifth Sunday of Lent. And when I say everyone, I mean everyone who is here in the sanctuary, as well as everyone who is out there on Zoom. And I just realized that the speakers on my cell phone behind me are on and I hope that it's not interfering with the sound that everyone is hearing on Zoom. Again, welcome to worship. I invite all of you to take a moment to think about who has gathered here this morning. Not only those of us in the sanctuary, but also all of those who are in their homes or wherever they have their computers or telephones. It is good to be together here this morning. I'm going to invite Shannon to begin with the land acknowledgements from Canmore. Good morning. Welcome everybody, whether you are in Western Canada like me or Eastern Canada or somewhere in between. Um, we begin our service by doing a land acknowledgement and today I'd like to share with you a land acknowledgement that has been done through the um, uh, Calgary Public Library. So I will share that now. I will try and share that now. <laughs> Excuse me, it doesn't seem to be I'm having a hard time finding my start button. I apologize for this technical challenge here. There we go. Hi, my name is Henry Drew and I am a staff here at the Calgary Public Library. I work at Central and I've been asked to do a little video to help educate people on land acknowledgements. So as you can see my little friend here, Charlie. Charlie was asking about land acknowledgements so I thought this would be a great way to show Charlie the land acknowledgement but also to show our friends and to talk about why a land acknowledgement is important. So I am from Treaty 8. I am Woodland Cree. Uh, my reserve is Driftball First Nations, and I am a visitor here in Treaty 7. So one of the reasons why land acknowledgements are so important is because it, in a way, we are giving back a sense of identity by honoring the original caretakers of the land that you're in. So I challenge everybody who is not from Calgary to find out where they're from and who are the original caretakers of that land. So here in Calgary, Treaty 7, Blackfoot Confederacy. This is Blackfoot ter territory. So we acknowledge um, our Blackfoot friends. So I'll go through it once and then I'll do it for you. So it's kind of, so we start with our seven fingers because we are in Treaty 7. So today we acknowledge our Treaty 7 friends. So this is sign language for friends. Where the Blackfoot meets at Elbows Bend. Soon came the Sutuna from the Beaver Clan and that's the beaver's tail for people that are wondering what that means. And then the Iskia and Nakoda in the mountain lands. Last but not least, so we do the infinity sign because that is the symbol on the Métis flag. Uh, last but not least, Métis people from region three. Together, we're all treaty people here in Calgary. So see how fun that was and interactive. So we're gonna do it again. This time, I'm not gonna pause. I'll go through it right from beginning to end. And I hope that you guys are practicing with me and you could always replay it and do it again. So when you come to story time at the library, you'll be able to do it. Okay, so let's get started. Today, we acknowledge our Treaty 7 friends where the Blackfoot meets at Elbows Bend. Soon came the Sutuna from the Beaver Clan and the Iskia Nakoda in the mountain lands. Last but not least, Métis people from Region 3. Together, we're all Treaty people here in Calgary. I hope Charlie liked that. Thanks. Over to you, Tim. In Markham, 
we acknowledge that we meet upon the traditional lands of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples. We also acknowledge we are part of the Williams Treaty. We are all treaty people. Welcome again to everyone, whoever you are, wherever you are. St. Andrew's United Church is delighted to have you in this worship circle this morning. St. Andrew's has a mission and a vision. At St. Andrew's United Church, our mission is inspiring faith, practicing compassion, and building connection in our community and the world. Our vision is to be creative and courageous people empowered by the Spirit, to practice love, reconciliation, and justice with authenticity, to be a spiritual home where Jesus' love for all is visible as we serve our diverse and multi-generational community. As we come together in worship, the light of Christ is with us, in us, and all around us. And I light the Christ candle to help us remember of Christ's light and presence here this morning. And I would like to draw your attention to all of the announcements that are printed in the order of service that was sent out to you at the, at the end of last week or in your hands in the printed version here this morning. I just want to start off with highlighting a couple of announcements. This is the fifth Sunday of Lent, which means that next Sunday, is Palm Sunday. You might wonder why I've got palms on the communion table a whole week early. Well, we will, Shannon and I will come to that oh, during the time with the children or the time for all ages uh, is soon in the service. The other announcement is about next Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week. Everyone's welcome for Palm Sunday here and at home on Thursday. Monday, Thursday, we will gather for worship on Zoom only. Same on Good Friday, Thursday at 7 p.m., Good Friday at 10 a.m. on Zoom only. And then, of course, in only two weeks' time, I would love to welcome everyone here and on Zoom for our Easter services. Service. And Michelle has an announcement for us, if we could spotlight Michelle. Thank you. Uh, I'm uh, if you noticed in the announcements this week, um, we're looking for volunteers. And I'd like to begin by saying a special thank you to Gunter, uh, who has been our faithful lawn care specialist for so many years. Up our front lawn, um, actually one of the highlights of Main Street. Everyone uh, knows it's the greenest space on Main Street, Markham. And uh, Gunter has been taking very good care of it. He is now hanging up his blades. So we are looking for volunteers from the community um, to help us keep that front lawn neat and beautiful. Um, if you are interested or know a young person who might be interested, please contact the office. Um, we'd like to explore volunteer opportunities before we turn in other directions. Thank you. And I just want to highlight uh, the other announcements that are in your order of service today. A uh, reminder about the Pothole Fundraiser and um, other volunteer and fellowship opportunities. I also do want to highlight uh, we're not having a lot of uptake on the uh, welcomes and um, theological banquet survey. <clears throat> it, well, the surveys work when people do them. So if you have not yet done 
Uh, particularly, we're looking at the Theological Banquet uh, survey. Uh, that would be very helpful to get an idea of the theological landscape of our congregation right now. I'm going to invite the um, folks on Zoom and those in the sanctuary to take a look around. Uh, those on Zoom can scroll through the uh, tiles uh, wherever those might show up on your screen. And I invite you to pass the peace of Christ, uh, both on Zoom and in the sanctuary. It's so lovely to see those of you in the sanctuary. Peace of Christ be with you all. The peace of Christ be with you. Let us come together in prayer. Let us pray. We give you thanks for your presence here this morning. O oh God, wherever we are hearing these words and wherever we are feeling your spirit within and among us, we thank you that we have come once again very close to the end of another Lenten season. And we pray that in the week that is left before Holy Week, we might become even more ready and more prepared to see your arrival, your passion, and the trial uh, of your uh, showing of God's love to the whole world. Hear these prayers and many others this morning, O God. For we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand after Michael does the introduction to the hymn and sing together number 233 in Voices United. Joyful, joyful, we adore you. The three verses.
Friends, let us join together in a spirit of confession. Let us pray. O God, you lavish the universe with life, poured out from the bounty of your blessedness. You share the aroma of your holiness with all creatures, great and small. We confess, O God, that while you lavish us with unconditional love, we have not always shared that with others. On the feet of those who hate us, we have not poured the aroma of love. With those who have hurt us, we have not shared the fragrance of forgiveness. On those who war with us, we have not spread the perfume of peace. On those who are harsh with us, we have not lavished enough of the scent of gentleness. On those who misunderstand us, we have not offered the bouquet of patience. On those who love us, we have not modeled the gentle humility of Christ in us. We confess, O Creator, that our humanness, in our humanness, we have not lavished enough. Forgive us and pour your love into our hearts, that our souls will hold the precious gifts that flow from your grace. Transform the debris of our sin into the sweet smell of holiness, that we may bless others with the aroma of love. In a moment of silence, we bring before the Divine One our personal prayers of confession and our realizations of how we have contributed to corporate sin where people have suffered. <clears throat> Friends, hear words of assurance. The God of overflowing mercy has forgiven us all of our sins. As we have gone out weeping and in shame, God pours upon us never-ending grace. Know that you are forgiven and come back to God with shouts of joy. Thanks be to God. Before we um, go into the children's time, uh, Tim, do you want to say a word about why you have a, a palm frond? I'm hoping that some of the families out there on Zoom have already heard about this, but just in case you have no idea, I'm going to give you a brief announcement and then get, get questions to me about it. Next Sunday, we would like to have videos of families in parade. And last week, the palm branches that are on the communion table now were downstairs. And I hope that some of you last Sunday picked up palm branches to use in your family parade videos. Uh, if this is the first you're hearing about it, please get back in touch with me uh, because it's, there's not very much time before next Sunday. And if you can do the videos today, that would be the best thing for the editor who's putting them together. And I don't have the capacity to put Yvonne's um, uh, uh, email address into onto the uh, the large screens at the church, but I have put Yvonne Weston's email address into the chat box. So if uh, you are seeing this on Zoom, you should be able to gather her. She's going to be gathering and editing the videos. Friends, today our Bible story talks about somebody who did something that was deeply meaningful to her but she was misunderstood. I would like to share a story about someone else who did something that was deeply meaningful to her and she was misunderstood as well. So this story is, uh, I've taken it right from CBC Kids News. This girl ignited a new awareness and pride or ribbon skirts and this happened back this story broke back in January uh, early January 2021 and so ribbon skirts are traditional for many indigenous nations a 10 year old girl that started a social movement after a school assistant at her school in Camp Sac Saskatchewan criticized her ribbon skirt Isabella Kulak is a member of Cote First Nation and proudly wore her ribbon skirt to school for formal day in December. 
It's black with lots of white flowers and a blue and green and black ribbon on it, Isabella told CBC News. I like that my Auntie Sarah made it for me, and it fits me really well. So what is a ribbon skirt? The ribbon skirt is a traditional piece of clothing across many Indigenous nations. It represents strength for Indigenous, indigenous women, and whip, ribbon skirts and the work that goes into making them are considered sacred. Indigenous men wear their own versions as ribbon shirts. When Isabella arrived at school, however, an educational assistant told her that her outfit was mismatched. And she suggested that Isabella wear something similar to a store-bought dress another classmate was wearing. Well, Isabella felt really badly. Isabella's family could see that she was upset and posted about what happened on Facebook. And there was an outpouring of support as others shared photos and videos of themselves in their own ribbon skirts or shirts. And what you're seeing is uh, a number of staff people from Standing Buffalo School um, uh, on the Fir Standing Buffalo First Nation Reserve north of Fort Capel, Saskatchewan. When Isabella returned to school after the holidays, an entire community showed up with her. Chiefs from different First Nations in the surrounding area joined her while a drum group performed. Many people arrived wearing ribbon skirts and shirts to share their pride with Isabella. It made Isabella happy to see her cousins, the Kokums, that's the Soto word for grandmother, and friends come to support her. While she may not have been pre prepared for the amount of attention that she's receiving, it has been empowering for her. She realizes that she is a powerful voice, even though she doesn't feel so big and mighty, her father, Chris Kulak, told CBC News. So there's a story of someone who did something that was important. She was misunderstood, but then a whole community came around her to um, offer a learning moment for that school and for other places. Let's sing together uh, two verses from a hymn that we learned back in October. Come touch our hearts. It's in More Voices number 12, and we're singing verses 2 and 3. Touch our souls that we may know and love you. Your quiet presence, all our fears dispel. Create a space for spirit to grow in us. Let life and beauty fill us. Come touch and bless our souls. Come touch our minds and teach us how to reason. Set free our thoughts to wonder and to dream. Help us to open doors of understanding to welcome truth and wisdom. Come touch and bless our minds. Today, Vivian is going to be reading the uh, scripture for us, and Vivian is reading from home. Over to you. Good morning. Today's scripture is from John 12, verses 1 to 8. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, 
one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money not and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Here ends the reading. Thanks be to God. I'm going to invite you, uh, everyone to pray with me, if you would. Holy One, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. So what if God were one of us? If God had a name, what would it be? If God had a face, what would it look like? What if God was one of us, just a slob like one of us, just a stranger on the bus, trying to make his way home? I'm so grateful to Lila and Ryan for singing that song. Um, it has been a meaningful song for me at various points, but it was particularly, it was a song that was often in my head in March, four years ago, when Greg and I were in Jerusalem, the occupied territories in Israel, doing a pilgrimage called Walking in the Footsteps of Jesus. I often had a sense of dislocation and at the same ta time, a sense of profound location in those two weeks. There was something about being in the spots that are talked about in the Gospels. And I found myself humming this song, what if God were one of us? And wondering if God were one of us, would I recognize God? This is a photo of the ruins at Capernaum. Those were walls of houses. And this is an archaeological dig that has taken us to first century. So Jesus would have known those houses. Jesus would have known the people who lived in those houses. Jesus would have been in those houses. I do believe in the mystery of the incarnation and in some that in some way powerful way God was embodied in Jesus and that God is embodied in each of us and that Jesus was God filled in a way that was unique and that he helped those around him experience God's realm in a, in a brand new way God's kingdom God's community at Capernaum, Jesus healed Peter's mother. On the shores of Lake Galilee at Capernaum, Jesus spoke to fishermen, and they left their lives behind in this town, and they followed him. They recognized something in Jesus. Hmm. Those fisher folk were his inner circle, his disciples, and they experienced and glimpsed this something different, this realm of God. In Pernum, I wondered if I would recognize, hmm, if I would have recognized Jesus. Would I have been one of the ones to catch a glimpse of God's kingdom community? Would I have wanted to follow Jesus? Now, surprisingly, that sense of location slash dislocation was even stronger in Jerusalem I think it was because there were places like this street outside of Richardson's Gate to the west of an intact wall from the vast temple that Herod built. The temple and this street were brand new in Jesus' day, just a couple of decades old. And this street is a first century street that has been excavated. Jesus and his disciples would have walked here on these stones that paved the street. They would have walked in and, and buy these shops just on the edge of the temple compound. 
And just around the corner of these steps were the steps that Jesus and his disciples climbed to enter the Golden Gates to the Temple Mount itself. You can see where archaeologists left a section of the original steps. They're kind of the messy steps in the middle of the picture on the left, and they are the messy steps <laughs> in the picture in the middle. The broad steps have been rebuilt, mostly for safety, but those steps in the middle are the stones that Jesus would have walked upon. And the picture on the right, it looks kind of like a pit. Well, that was one of the ritual baths available for people visiting the temple. They're called mikvahs. Jesus and everyone else took off their clothes and bathed in the cleansing waters of the mikvah before entering the sacred space of the Temple Mount. Now, this long, skewed photograph is a panorama shot. It's from the Golden Gates at the top of the steps and above the mikvah. From this spot, Jesus would have entered the temple. Or if he was leaving, he would have stepped out of the temple precinct and looked across the Kidron Valley to the Mount of Olives on the left. Or to Bethany, just over the hill in the middle of the picture, about four kilometers from this spot to the home of his friends, Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Lazarus, his dear friend who Jesus raised from death shortly before the dinner party described in our story today. That first day that we visited the Golden Gates, there was a great crowd of Christian pilgrims on the spot covering the steps attending a concert. But on this day, there were just a few of us. And again, I wondered if I would recognize Jesus in a crowd at the gates of the temple. Or if I were a member of the intimate dinner party four kilometers away in Bethany, would I recognize Jesus the way Mary did? Would I recognize Jesus as God with us? This is a very important story to the first Christians. It's pretty hard to read these words on the screen, but these are the four stories in the four Gospels. And we know it's important because only the really important stories to the whole Christian community had a story show up in each of the Gospels. Now, there's interesting differences and similarities in the four versions of the stories. In both Matthew and Mark's version of the story, the woman is unnamed, and she anoints the head of Jesus, not his feet. You see, a king is anointed on the head with oil. The feet of a dead person is anointed with oil. In John's version, the woman who does the anointing is Jesus' beloved disciple, Mary of Bethany. In all of the versions of the story, there is a negative reaction by others about the extravagance of the act. But John's version is the only one that has the negative reaction coming from the mouth of Jesus. Uh, Judas, sorry. So the roles of Judas and Mary are set in contrast with one another. Now, the significance of the story is underlined in both Matthew and Mark with Jesus closing the scene by defending the actions of the unnamed woman, saying she has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. And in those two versions, the funny thing is, we don't actually know her name. Jesus ties together the act of anointing a king with the anointing for burial, and he announces that her action will be remembered with the same degree of honor as the actions of the Last Supper. This year we hear the story from John's Gospel, and it comes in the very next chapter following that strange story I mentioned of Jesus raising Lazarus from death. Following that miracle, Jesus and his disciples attend a dinner in his honor, and Mary, the sister who in an earlier story annoyed her sister Martha because she chose to sit and listen to Jesus rather than help Martha with the cooking and the cleaning. Well, Mary brings an extravagant amount of perfume and anoints the feet of Jesus with her hair. Her behavior is so strange, Barbara Brown Taylor explains the layer of layers of strangeness, saying, and I quote, 
Then as everyone in the room watches her, she does four remarkable things in a row. First, she loosens her hair in a room full of men, which an honorable woman never does. Then she pours perfume on Jesus' feet, which is also not done. The head, maybe. People do that to kings, but not the feet. Then she touches him. A single woman rubbing a single man's feet, also not done, not even among friends. Then she wipes the perfume off with her hair. Totally inexplicable. The bizarre end to an all-round bizarre act. Death was in the air. Jesus had brought her brother back from the tomb, which resulted in furthering the plot to kill Jesus. She knew that the raising of her dead brother, who had been in his tomb four days, had resulted in the authorities calling for the arrest of Jesus. Those authorities would have been discussing Jesus and plotting his death on the other side of the Temple Mount from those steps we were just looking at, about four kilometers away from Bethany. All of them were in grave danger. By deciding to go to, into Jerusalem for the Passover feast, Jesus knew that he was about to walk a path that would very likely result in his own death. And so into this moment, heavy with the presence of death, Mary followed that way of prophets before her, and she enacted her fourfold bizarre act. She responded to the fear of the impending threat from those who wanted Jesus dead with an act of extravagant love. Mary recognized that Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah and that he was willing to willingly walking into danger rather than running away from it. In front of their friends and neighbors, she publicly anointed his feet with pure nard, perfume used for the burial of the dead. The story is remembered in four different ways in the four Gospels, and in all four accounts, the action of the woman anointing Jesus was, ex was challenged as overly extravagant, and in John, it's Judas that says that such an extravagant ointment should have been sold and the money given to the poor. Well, Jesus recognized Jesus. Judas recognized Jesus as well in the importance of doing what one could to lessen the suffering of the poor. But Judas did not recognize Jesus in that moment. Nor did he recognize the prophetic role that Mary was bringing to life in that very moment. But Mary recognized Jesus. Beyond just knowing her friend and teacher, Jesus, Mary recognized the power of that particular moment in time. Instead of waiting to anoint the dead body of Jesus, Mary expressed her grief and her deep love of Jesus and her recognition that his days were very likely numbered. Mary could not have known the details of the week that was to come. What she knew was that she had the power to express the love that she felt for Jesus and for the new world that was breaking into her life and to, into all of the lives that were being transformed through contact with Jesus. Into the heart of that dangerous time, Mary acted out of her core belief to express her deep love for Jesus and her recognition that the transforming love of God was present as he faced the danger that awaited him in Jerusalem. While I was standing in the land of the Holy One four years ago, walking where Jesus walked, I wondered if I would recognize Jesus. What if God were one of us? Would we know? Would we have the eyes and heart to see? Would we have the courage and the love of Mary to act with scandalous extravagance? Friends, as we enter the final two weeks of Lent this year, I pray that our hearts and our eyes and our minds will recognize Jesus in our midst and that our hands and our whole selves would pour out love as Mary has done. May it be, may it be so. Amen. I'm going to invite us to basically recap the story in the next hymn, said Judas to Mary. It's number 129 in Voices United. We're singing.
We're singing the whole thing because it tells the story. Judas to Mary, now what would you do with your ointment so rich and so rare? I'll pour it all over the feet of the Lord, now wipe it away with my hair, she said. Wipe it away with my hair. Oh Mary, oh Mary, oh what about for this ointment it could have been so And think of the blankets and think of the bread You could buy with the silver and gold, he said Buy with the silver and gold Tomorrow, tomorrow, I'll think of the poor Tomorrow, she said, not today. For dearer than all of the poor in the world is my love who is going away, she said. My love who is going away. Said Jesus to Mary, your love is so deep. Today you may do as you will. Tomorrow you say I am going away, but my body I leave with you still, he said. My body I leave with you still. The poor of the world are my body, he said. To the end of the world they shall be. The bread and the blankets you give to the poor, you'll know you have given to me, he said. You'll know you have given to me. My body will hang on the cross of the world. Tomorrow, he said, not today. And Martha and Mary will find me again and wash all my sorrow away, he said. Wash all my sorrow away. I want to join with you all in giving of our gifts, our talents, and our support to God's work and God's mission, the work of St. Andrew's United Church and the Mission and Service Fund of our national church. We are grateful for this continuing support that you have been able to offer, even though we are not passing the plates on Sunday morning, uh, we are continuing to offer our gifts and our support and we invite you to say thank you and to acknowledge the tremendous, uh, the important uh, uh, part of our worship in offering this morning. Let's sing together. Please remain seated as we sing together. Grant us God the grace of giving.
as I invite you to join your hearts and minds in the prayers of the people, we are going to move to that time of prayer also in music, in singing. The words are going to be on the screen in a moment. Open our hearts, open our minds, open our lives to you, O loving God. And that short verse is going to be sung before and at the end before the Lord's Prayer is said together of the prayers of thanksgiving. Let us bring our hearts and minds and spirits together in music. Open our hearts, open our minds, open our our hearts to you, O oh God, we give thanks. You have blessed us in ways too many to be counted, and you continue to bless us even in times that seem frustrating and difficult in our world. We thank you for hearts that reach out to those who are suffering and in pain. We thank you for the frustration that we feel when we wish to end violence and the loss of life in our world. We give you thanks that that frustration and anger sometimes leads to the action that makes a difference and calls forth peace even in difficulty. Lord, as we go into another new week, we hold with care the people of Ukraine, people who have shown their determination to live a life of community and caring in a way that was not expected. And we pray that those who sought to destroy that kind of community and determination may fail in their efforts. Lord, we pray this morning for those who have lost loved ones recently. We pray that they find in the midst of grief the way of your compassion and your passion that we acknowledge in the coming Holy Week in our church community. We pray that we are convinced that death is not the end, that our love continues to grow and continues to surround those who are with us in person as well as those who are with us in spirit. Help us, O oh God, to recognize your Son, that if you were one of us, that we would notice and respond and grow in that love. Hear all these prayers we offer, O oh God, and as we Prepare to join in the prayer your son taught us. Hear the song that we sing. Our hearts, open our minds, open our lives to you, O loving. Okay. 
in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The hymn is 642, Be Thou My Vision, and we're going to sing verses 1, 2, and 4. Let us join as Michael leads us. May our mouths be filled with laughter and our hearts with shouts of joy. May God anoint our week with grace and beauty 
And we, may we all anoint and lavish others with God's love. May it be so. Amen. Thank you.